realized when we looked at the schedule that we didn't have a Lent topic. And we said, we really need to talk about Lent, because it's important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's almost here. It's Wednesday. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about Lent tonight and just, you know, where it began, what it means, and what the church um, sort of expects from us, and what kind of period of time it is in the church's liturgical year. Um, as part of your handouts, we're also going to talk about the Rite of Elect, which is next Sunday, here at 1045 Mass, and then at 3 o'clock at the Cathedral. We're going to go over the whole thing. Um, I made copies of the entire ritual for you, so we'll go through so you know what to expect. Um, and we'll talk about the day, the times, so all of that. Um, also there in your in one of your packets is an examination of conscience. So already was in on your CD, um, but I printed that out again because I realized that <coughs> next Sunday is the right of election, and next Monday, a week from tonight, is our reconciliation service. And we won't meet again until next Monday when we have a reconciliation service. So I want to talk a little bit about that and what to expect and maybe to use the examination of conscience. So, um, we have a lot to cover, but um, it'll be fun, as it always is. <laughs> so, Lent in the church history is a 40-day period before Easter. Always starts on a Wednesday, called Ash Wednesday. Um, and it goes until Holy Thursday. That is the end of Lent. And then we start the Triduum, which is the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter, Easter. Easter. Sundays are not typically, are not, are not in the season of Lent. Let's say they're exempt. They don't count in the 40 days because Sunday is the day of the resurrection of the Lord. So Sundays is always, you know, the, the, the day of the Lord, the, you know, the, the most important day of, you know, our, our life as Christians. So Sunday is not included in that period of Lent. Um, Lent developed in the fourth century. Um, and there were three things that sort of made it come about. Um, the first, there was an ancient Paschal feast that was a two-day observance before the Easter Vigil. Um, so Lent back then was just two days, and then slowly it evolved into the 40 days that we know now. The second is what you are, are experiencing, was the catechumenate process. Lent was really um, came about and developed because they felt that those who were becoming Catholic needed this extra time before the Easter Vigil to, you know, to become closer to God, to really discern what they were about to be doing. Um, a time of, of purification, of really looking into themselves and seeing what things they still needed to kind of fine tune or obstacles they needed to kind of get through to become closer to God. So the so Lent really began as a, this type of um, purification for the person who was coming into the church. And then the third source was, after a period of time, you know, they're watching all of these, these wonderful you know, new people excited about the faith and, and, and you know, doing what was necessary to become closer to God. That those who had sort of come into the church maybe a few years prior, or more than a few years prior, you know, they sort of fallen away, and especially those who have kind of gotten into serious sin. So then they thought, well, we shouldn't just make Lent something for those people who are coming into the church. We should, we should do it too. So those penitents, um, it's called the Order of Penitents, um, joined the catechumens in their process. And so Lent became not just for the catechumens, not just for those seeking um, um, and coming into the church, but for everyone. Um, so the purpose of Lent, it's, it's a season of fasting, you'll hear that, it's a season of self-denial, um, penitence, but more important, it's a season of conversion. Um, growing up Catholic, you know, we all knew that Lent started with Ash Wednesday, we went to church, we got ashes as a sign of the cross on our forehead, we couldn't eat meat on Friday, um, and my mother made us do some other things. You know, what are we giving up? You know, something that we really like to eat that we wouldn't eat. You know, we favorites would give up candy. Um, so we kind of grew up 
thinking, well, that it's a season to, to kind of deny yourself certain pleasures, and then at the end of it all, becomes Easter, and you don't have to do it anymore. But we kind of missed the whole point of it. I mean, the point of fasting, the point of self-denial, the point of, of really living a more simple lifestyle is because we're supposed to be you know, on the verge of a deeper conversion. I mean, we're, the church in, its, in her wisdom know how busy everybody is. And, we, and you know, yes, we go to church on Sundays, maybe we go a little bit during the week, um, maybe we're involved in our churches. But for the most part, you know, we get out, we go to work, we take care of our families. We're so, so busy that we don't really take the time that we should to cultivate and really examine our relationship with God. So the church sets aside these six weeks prior to the biggest feast of the year, you know, the, the, the deed of our salvation, for us to really take that time. And the cool thing about it is that everybody's doing it. It's, it's, it there's a solidarity about it so that, you know, people can get together and talk about their Lent and growth. It becomes, you know, something that's more easy to talk about your relationship with the Lord because your fellow Catholics are all doing the same thing. We're all in the same, same mode. Um, actually, Lent comes from a Germanic word for springtime. So the, the, the thing is, it's, 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 you're doing all this growing and your conversion and you're, and you're looking at your life so that at Easter time, you can have new life, just the way the Lord gave us all new life through his resurrection. Um, ashes, on, on, on Ash Wednesday, the, the ancient practice, and this goes way back to, if you remember, um, the city of Nineveh, and it was the guy in the fish, Jonah. Jonah. Jonah was asked to go to Nineveh and ask them to repent of their evil ways, and Jonah said, no, 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 I don't want to, I'm going to hide from the Lord, so he kind of goes the other way. And the fish swallows him up, and he spits him back out, and Joseph says, well, okay, I guess i got to do it. So he goes. <laughs> but the cool thing is, you. <laughs> you know, as, as opposed to some other cities that maybe didn't fare so well, is that Nineveh listened to Jonah. And in their sadness and their contrition over all the evil things and the ways that they were living, they donned sackcloth and ashes, which, you know, says that they, you know, put on cloth, sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and I guess that was, I mean, you would know, Brian, that was a symbol of, you know. Self-deprecating. Right. I'm, I'm nothing. You know, God is all, and I am, I am, you know, I am so low because I have done all these things to offend God. So it goes all the way back to that. So when we get the ashes, you go up to receive the ashes, and you are all most, we would encourage you to do that. We would encourage you to attend Mass. On Wednesday, we have at 7.30 in the morning, 12.10 in the afternoon, and 5.30 in the evening, if you can make any of those. And when they do the distribution of ashes that should come up, the priest will say one of two things. He will say, um, remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That is meant for us to remember who we are in the presence of God. We are God's created. We have, um, we know our place. We are mortal and we will, our bodies will die one day. But because of Christ's resurrection, we will live forever. Um, and then the other, the other thing they say is repent and believe in the gospel. Um, so the priest will say one of those two things as he signs the cross on your forehead with the ashes. And it is kind of a cool thing, especially if you get in the morning. So you know you're running around work and you're going to McDonald's for lunch and you're and, and you see all these people with ashes on the floor. You're like, aha! You're Catholic. <laughs> it is kind of a really cool sense of of solidarity that you know. Usually, I mean, other than Ash Wednesday, if you think about you know how would you tell another Catholic from another Catholic, you know this is this is really. And then when you're on TV and you see people with ashes. On the, I mean, that's even better. Like, you know, an anchor person. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the ashes on our forehead um, indicates our recognition of the need for deeper conversion of our lives during this season. So there are three things, three pillars of the Lent observance. We observe Lent by prayer, extra prayer, by fasting and almsgiving. Um, the law of fast 
for us Catholics um, means only one full meal a day with nothing in between for two days, like Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. So on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, we are supposed to have one full meal and then two other simple smaller meals and no meals in between. Um, and this is for people who are 18 years of, old, of age until they're 60. And you don't have to do it if you're prior to 18 or over 60 um, for health reasons. Abstinence means the refraining from eating meat. And again, it's only on Wednesday and Good Friday. And it's anyone who is over the age of 14. And it's just Fridays in Lent. Um, fasting and abstinence is actually one of the most ancient practices um, linked to Lent. It actually is before Lent ever came about. Um, the early church fasted intensely for two days before the celebration of the Easter Vigil. And then it became a 40-day period of fasting. Um, I remember as a child, it was every Friday. You had to stay in for the to on Fridays. Um, now, it's, like I said, it's only Wednesday and Ash Wednesday and Friday. Fasting um, is actually a very spiritual act. Um, it's not just the way everybody says, well, you know, what are you going to give up for Lent? Well, you know, I'm going to give up potato chips and soda because maybe I'll lose 10 pounds in the process. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's a great, really, I mean, if you think about it, it's sort of like this, this dual function. Um, but it's really not about that. Fasting is about taking something away from you, from yourself, um, that will create a hunger. When we fast, we're hungry. We're hungry than usually. Normally, we're not used to being hungry. You know, we're so blessed in this country that when we're hungry, we eat. And we eat even when we're not hungry. We'll eat in front of the TV, or we'll eat just because it's pleasurable. Um, but if we deny ourselves that very act, it creates a hunger in us. And that hunger is supposed to remind us of a few things. It reminds us of those who truly are hungry. We truly are hungry in material ways, who, who are not getting enough to eat in the world. Um, those who are hungry for an understanding of God's love or an understanding of um, any love. You know, those who are hungry for love in, in any um, situation. Um, or it um, reminds us that, for me, it reminds us of, Lord, you know, I'm hungry, so I'm hungry for you. My hunger, my physical hunger, that gnawing in my stomach, reminds me that, yes, I need food, and yes, I want this and I want that, but I want you more than anything. So it's that, that actual gnawing in your stomach when you're hungry should remind you of certain things. That's, you know, it's, it's one of those tangible feeling symbols that we have. You, know, you can't see it, but you actually can feel that hunger. Um, for me also, it means that, let's say I give up something that I really, really like, and you know, I'm used to, I eat it whenever I want, because I can, because I'm 55 years old and I can. Not that it means that I have to be 55 and I can, but you know, I mean, I can do whatever I want. If I give up something that really, really means something to me, um, to me, for me, that's telling God that God, I want you more than that thing. That you're more important to me than having that thing. Because going through everyday life, we're so busy, and it's so hard to remember, even up here, that God is the most important thing in our life, and that our relationship with God is more important than anything. Because we're so involved in our jobs and our relationships and raising our families that you know if if we're giving up something willfully and, we, and and you know when you give up something you want it more than you ever wanted it. I mean at least that's the way for me. If I say I'm gonna I'm gonna refrain from alcohol for the rest of the Lent, that's what I want to drink really really bad. <laughs> that's what I want. This is what I can't have it. Um, and to me, every time I would say that to myself, I'd say, I, I know God, I really, really want it, but I said I would give it up for you because I want you to know that you're more important than this drink that I really want, or this, you know, cherry pie, which is my favorite dessert. 
Um, even the prophet Isaiah has something to say about it. He insists that fasting without changing our behavior is not pleasing to God. This, rather, is the fasting that I wish, releasing those bound unjustly, and tying the thongs of the yoke, setting free the oppressed, breaking every yoke, sharing your bread with the hungry, sheltering the oppressed and the homeless, clothing the naked when you see them, and not turning your back on your errand. So fasting is supposed to change us. You know, it's not supposed to be something we just do for 40 days and man, I can't wait for Easter Vigil night when I can, you know, down an entire bottle of wine and a huge <laughs> cherry pot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I remember that because my mother used to love chocolate Easter eggs. I mean, just loved them. And I remember it was a ritual on Holy Saturday after 12 noon. She'd break out all the Easter eggs and cut them in half and we all got to eat Easter eggs because it was the, the at Lent was over. But it's, it's more than that. It's not just, okay, I did it, you know, I, I, I ran the race, I fought the good fight, I did it, I'm proud of myself. I should have changed. Something should have occurred in me to make me closer to God, to make me know that God is more important in my life than, than everything else. Um, okay. Oh, and also another, another word about um, abstaining meat. Um, meat, still, even though it's much more plentiful, but you know, when I think of meat, like really, really good meat, I think of Ruth Chris's fifty dollars steak. <laughs> I mean, still, meat is more dear than you know, trout or or fish or something. Maybe not lobster, but I guess the point I'm trying to make is the whole reason that the church kind of came with this is because meat still is. Um, something that's, that's very hard to come by for those who are poor. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll eat hot dogs or, or macaroni and cheese or, but, you know, to buy meat, to buy a steak, um, to buy a good round roast or something like that, they, they can't afford that. Um, so again, it's to remind us of what people go without and what can we do to, to relieve that suffering. So on a Friday, if you're going out to your, your local restaurant and you have, you know, an entire lobster, um, I was in the islands last week when I was on vacation, and you know we had one of the meals was was an entire lobster. Well, you know I, I wasn't um, I wasn't suffering that night. <laughs> <laughs> so you know if you're going to take it in the spirit of oh well you know I can have crab cake and I can have this and I can have that, you just miss the point. You know it is giving up that thing that is a luxury for many, many people, um, so that you can understand that you know it is our job to do more for the poor. It, it really is. Um, and so that goes into the, the second pillar, which is almsgiving. Um, almsgiving meaning um, whatever kind of care, whether it be financial support, whether it be um, you know going out to help out, you know, at a, at a a meal, my sister's place has three meals a day that they serve. Um, it, it, is, it is really the heart of Catholic social teaching, um, almsgiving, the, that portion. And the Basilica will be doing what's called um, the Rice Bowl Project. Hopefully I'll get the materials in time for Sunday. Um, but the Catholic Relief Services does this, and you know, you get this little a cardboard bowl that you somehow put together, and you fill it with coins, I believe, quarters or yellow pieces. Um, and then they all go back to CRS, and CRS Catholic Relief Services, as you know, goes in to help you know, all of those devastated places, um, you know, like, like when Haiti had an earthquake and those types of places. Um, so, you know, parishes will, you know, usually some parishes, most parishes hopefully, will pick a project that maybe everybody can do. Um, but that doesn't mean that personally you can't commit to doing something above and beyond what you've already decided to do, you know, as, as a Christian. Um, you know, if you decided to, to give more money to your favorite charity or help out at um, our daily bread or, or, or something like that, that is that is part of, to, to kind of remind us that, you know, we are supposed to take care of the poor. That is part of who we are as Catholic Christians. And then prayer. Um, 
That's the third bullet, prayer, and we are asked to actually look at the way we pray. Look at our prayer habits. Look at how much time we spend in prayer. Look at um, our personal prayer. Look at our community prayer. Um, look at how we read the scripture. You know, maybe we want to read scripture more. Maybe we want to um, get, when I, I gave him his little Henry Nauman um, booklets, the meditation every day for Lent, just like we did for Advent. Um, it, it is a way that we, and, and part of our prayer, part of the community's prayer, is to pray for all of you. Um, like I said, way back when Lent began, it was the process that by which the catechumens were purifying and getting themselves ready to become members of the church. And so the whole church, their job, or you know, their um, part of, of, of their promise was to pray for the catechumens. So, you know, part of that will be, we will be reminding our congregation at the Basilica to pray for you every Sunday. We will be reminding them to do that. So Lent is a great time to try out a new type of prayer. You know, maybe you're not used to saying the rosary, but maybe for Lent you, you decide to say the rosary, you know, once a week or once a day, or um, the Liturgy of the Hours, or maybe attend morning Mass a couple times. Um, I will tell you, at least personally, that whatever you decide to do and you do it for six weeks, you don't want to, you won't, you won't stop at the end of Lent. That will become a new habit for you. Um, I started going to Mass in the morning just during Lent. I figured, well, you know, I worked in the building at the time, and it was only across the street, so I figured, you know, once or twice a, a, day, a week, I would go over to Mass. And before I knew it, I was going two days, and then three days, and then by the end of Lent, I was going every day, and that is still my practice now. And it's easy for me, I, you know, because I, I, now I work there, so I like, get myself out of bed on time. You know, I'm there, I have two times every day to make Mass, and it's really just walking across the, the sidewalk, so I have no excuse. But what I'm telling you is that whatever you decide to do for Lent, you'll get used to it, you'll like it, and then it will become part of your practice, and that's how conversion happens. You know, you'll, because you're not going to Mass just because it's Lent, now you're going to Mass because you love going to Mass. You're not going to say the Rosary just because it's Lent, you're going to say the rosary because somehow in doing so, it touched you, and in meditating on the mysteries of, of Mary's life and Christ's life, that did something for you. So you're going to continue doing that. So I tell you, the church is really smart in, in, in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, it, 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 it kind of gives us these things, and it holds them up, and it's not like saying, you must, you must, you must, but it's a suggestion. And then we do it, and then we're hooked. <laughs> so, you know, it's sort of like it's set aside every year to kind of to get a little more. So every Lent, we should be different. We should be different people this Lent than we were last Lent. And we should be different people six weeks from now. Um, even if it's one little thing. Even if you notice one little thing about yourself that um, is different. And I will tell you that prayer, um, I've done some talks on, on prayer, and I, I have to do a talk on prayer next week. We were doing a confirmation class here. And um, I was reading through my notes from the talk that I gave last at the RCIA last year. And one of the things that I said was, you know, you change your prayer and when you commit to more prayer time, when you commit to really spending a set amount of time, not just whispering, you know, help me, Lord, or and that's important. You need to do that. That brings Christ to mind all day. But at least, you know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is, just dedicated time with the Lord, it, you will be changed. You will be better. There will be something about you that will change. You will become, if you wanted to be a patient person, you'll be more patient. It's just, it's just amazing. It's just, it happens. I can remember praying and praying and praying as I was a young mother with five kids. And I'm a type A personality. I did not handle crises well, especially little crises. You know, spill of milk, and I would just go off. I, I was not a real happy, fun person to be around. 
ask my children. They tell you they had a great childhood, but at the same time, they remember, you know, there were times where just mommy would just, having five kids all in the space of about 10 years and being totally type A and wanting things to be perfect, something had to go. So my perfectionism had to go. <laughs> they weren't gonna change. Um, so he said, pray for God, oh, give me patience, give me patience, I can't, I wanna be a good mother, but all this stuff bothers me. And you know, the more time I spent with prayer and the harder life got, the more patient I got. I mean, it was just amazing because I, I, I changed. I, I completely, things don't bug me as much as they used to. Maybe that's wisdom, maybe that's a little because I've been through some stuff, maybe it's just because I'm older, but I firmly believe it's because I spend time in prayer. And I know that when I fall back and I don't spend as much time and I let it go and I let it go and I let it go, I revert and I start to become a person that I'm gonna be. So God does amazing things and you just, you just have to kind of just, just sit in his presence and let him do it. I mean, and, and we have, um, as you know, we have adoration here, uh, Monday through Friday, eight o'clock to four o'clock. And it's really hard hours for some people because you work in during those times. But spending a little bit of time in front of the Blessed Sacrament is even double. It, it, is, it is just very powerful. Um, I was down there today, and there were like two or three people there who works. I mean, we, we have people who sign up for specific hours because we have to make sure someone's there during those hours. But there, every time I go down there now, there's people, there's more and more people there who weren't there, they didn't sign up. Like it's not their quote unquote, they're committed out, but they're there. Um, and you know, Monsignor said this, and I totally believe it. He came from a parish that did perpetual adoration, and they did it 24 hours a day. So they had a combination lock on the door, and everybody, and, and they had a 3 a.m., and a 2 a.m., and a 1 a.m., and people covered it. And amazing things happened in that parish. And I see it happening here. I, I mean, our attendance is up. Our collections are up. We have people turning out for things that normally people weren't, you know, attending. Um, I truly believe that, you know, we, we do what the Lord asks of us. And people are changed. And things happen. And, um, and, and the other thing that we'll do for, for prayer um, is at the Basilica here on Fridays, after 7.30 Mass, we're gonna have a BYOB. That's one senior's little term, break your own Bible. Bible study. We're gonna have it over in the residence, which is where the Archbishop lives, after 7.30. And then at 12.10, after the 12.10 Mass on Fridays, we're gonna be having it over here. Um, I don't know if you know, Jeff Allen is one of our electors. Um, big, big kind of guy, booming voice. I mean, when he proclaims the word, you hear it. Um, he's gonna be doing Bible studies for the Friday afternoons. Um, he's very well you know, versed in scripture. Um, so those are two more opportunities to maybe consider. Meals, well, light breakfast and light lunch will be offered to at those times. So, yeah, here at Basilica, we're trying to, to give some opportunity um, for everyone to kind of do a little bit more, and then we encourage you to do some more on your own. Are there any questions? Anything you always wanted to know about Lent and were afraid to ask? There is an old tradition. Um, I had it in my family that, well, of course you know Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras in New Orleans on the Tuesday before, called Shrove Tuesday, where they party it up in the whole nine yards. Well, that comes from partying it up in the whole nine yards because they will be self-denying themselves for the next six weeks. Um, and my family, and I don't know if it's the Polish tradition or not, German, maybe it was a German position. We always have pancakes. Anybody have pancakes on Tuesday? Yeah. Did you ever have pancakes? My mother used to wrap up coins in tin foil and they cook them inside the pancakes. Mm. Oh, that would have been great. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> <laughs> like, we didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, we really were really that. We loved it. We got quarters. Yeah, but that's what got dimes and nickels, not, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, always had pancakes on Tuesday before. I, and 
I researched this last year and I cannot remember where it came from. Oh no, I remember where it came from. I don't remember exactly who did it, but they, but some culture needed to use up all of their flour and stuff, eggs and, eggs and, all, and all that stuff, mm -hmm. because they weren't going to use it for Lent. So they made all these pancakes and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, a lot of the, the cult, cult, different cultures have traditions for Trove Tuesday, and a lot of the Eastern churches and the Orthodox churches, they have heavy-duty fasting still, which we used to do as well, but it's not as severe as it used to be. But it used to be everybody, and it's still in the Orthodox church, they give up all dairy, you know, all sugar, uh, flour products, I don't not much to eat. Brown rice and vegetables, I guess, is what they eat for Lent. But, you know, it's a major fast. And so a lot of cultures, the things they ate, like pancakes or certain cakes and pastries, were to use up all the stuff in the, in the pantry that they weren't going to be eating through, through Lent. Very practical. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? You said you mentioned opportunity, that, you know, these opportunities we have, and that's this is something for all of you. Uh, this is a really a great opportunity to prepare for the vigil, because the vigil will be a change in your life. It really will change your lives. In fact, uh, Bishop Madden, if he does, does he get more vigil? You know? He should be, yes. Because he, he always says out on the memorial in the portico, lighting the um, Paschal candle, he always tells everybody there, including the congregation, that tonight your life will change. And it really does. Life does change. But for all of you who are going to be confirmed and those baptized, this is going to be a momentous occasion. It really is. And just see Lent as an opportunity to really prepare yourself. And, and if you do it for no other reason, do it because God has brought you to this, this point in your lives. And, and he's really been calling you probably for umpteen years, but you're, you're really hearing him. And you really want to experience his presence in your lives totally. And I would say just do it for God. You know, just do something, something that's important in your life. Something that's an idol in your life that you, you maybe you should put it aside for this 40 days. Go ahead and do it and do it for God. And just allow Him to really prepare you for, for the vigil. Because it's going to be a, a, a really great experience for everybody. And you know, you know we can, God is our Father and as, you know, our, our parent. Um, you know, we parents, those who have children here, you know, when our kids do something really good, we take notice of that. And we like to reward them for that. I remember my mom was the oldest, and I had four <coughs> brothers and sisters, and you know, I was always doing all the hard work and you know, cleaning the house, and I, I really was. And, uh, and my mother would make me clothes because you know we were living on one income, and so she would make me clothes. So I knew that to, for her to make me clothes, it would be helpful if she was freed up from some of the other household duties. I would go and clean the whole house and do the dishes and do the laundry and stuff because I knew she was sewing me clothes and she made me beautiful clothes. You know, I kind of think that's, you know, so as a parent, you know, we're doing something for God. We're showing God that, God, I love you more than this activity that I love or this food that I love. You know, I believe God rewards that. You know, as a loving parent, he sees that we're doing something very good, and he will want to reward us for that. Um, you know, I, I, I think, you know, Brian talked about the Trinity and, you know, how God is Father, Son, and Spirit in those three identities. And so the parent of God, God the parent, you know, wants to reward his children when they do a good job. I have to believe that. I, I do believe that. Okay? You can just let that off. <laughs>